For our next session this afternoon, I'd like to introduce the panel entitled The Partnerships of Tomorrow, Driving Collaboration and Empowering the Fintech SME and Startup Community. Uh, we've got a great lineup joining the session um, and leading the session as the moderator, we have Paul Mulatto, who is the CEO of Alrider Finance. I'd like to hand over to Paul to get things started. Thank you, Julia. Uh, first, let's start off by introducing uh, each of the members of the panel. If you, I will go around to each one of you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and the organization that you're with. Uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Bern Van Linder. Uh, please introduce yourself and, and your organization. Thank you, Paul. My name is Bernd van Linder. I'm the CEO of Commercial Bank of Dubai, the sixth or seventh largest bank in the UAE. Um, before I moved to Commercial Bank of Dubai, I spent a little over 10 years at Saudi Arandi Bank, which later on became Al Awal and is now part of, uh, of Saab, of which the last uh, seven years and a bit as the CEO. I have a personal interest in fintechs and technology in general. Um, about 25 years ago, I did a PhD in artificial intelligence, which was uh, way ahead of the curve, but, but clearly explains or shows that I'm very interested in what we're going to discuss today. Thank you, Paul. Yep. Allah, please continue. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, this is Ala Al Mashhadi. I'm the Chief Business Development Officer at the Saudi Credit Bureau SIMA. Um, uh, a bit of background uh, uh, around 15 years in, in the banking industry uh, and now with the Credit Bureau. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, my role is covering all of the commercial side and the uh, business development and enablement side of the, of the Credit Bureau in Saudi Arabia, which is the leading. Uh, credit bureau in the uh, uh, MENA region uh, uh, with with uh, uh, full control of the uh, commercial and consumer business in Saudi Arabia. Fantastic. The fun show. Your, your microphone. Thank you. So, yep. Uncho Edo, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Mojo Trust Microfinance Bank. Um, we're a bank that uh, uh, we've all, we're one of the banks that champion uh, the microfinance lending using online platforms. So I'm also a member of the FinTech Association of Nigeria. I'm also um, a FinTech enthusiast uh, uh, and I, I also financially oriented. Thank you. Great. Uh, Craig, please go forward. Yeah, hi. Um, so, Craig Moore, I'm the founder and CEO of Beehive. Uh, Beehive is an SME uh, digital lending platform uh, originally based in the UAE, uh, shortly into uh, KSA. And our focus for the last five and a half years has really been helping SMEs get access to finance, not only at competitive rates, but also accelerate the time to finance, which is one of the main bugbears of a lot of SMEs, uh, not just in this region, but generally uh, around the world. Fantastic, and Mohammed. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I am the Director of Financial uh, Sector Development Department at Central Bank. I've been in, with experience in the Central Bank for around 13 years. Plus, where we uh, shifted from making uh, policy, banking policy, to 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 advising in the G20 and moving toward the uh, financial sector development, uh, responsible for strategies that is related to fintech, strategies related to opening the and collaboration between uh, banks as well as uh, fintechs. Thank you. Fantastic. Let's kick this session off. I'm going to start with you, Dr. Van Linder. In regards to partnerships and banks uh, with fintechs, uh, what's your what's your firm's approach in regards to partnering with fintechs? Uh, have you been able to uh, achieve your goals in partnering with fintechs? And what do you look for in a fintech that you're uh, potentially going to partner with? Thank you, Paul. Um, I I firmly believe that a bank cannot afford not to work with fintechs. Uh, there's clearly added value provided by agile, innovative companies that banks typically are not able to, to bring them, uh, themselves to the table. 
So um, uh, the, the question is not whether you have to work with fintechs, that to me is a given, but how best to work with fintechs. When I look at Commercial Bank of Dubai, we're a mid-sized bank operating in the UAE only. We clearly don't have the resources that some of the big multinational or global banks have. So unlike say a JP Morgan or a BBVA, we, we cannot afford to run our own VC, our own venture capitalist unit. So we, we have to operate in a different way. We also don't really have the skills or the expertise in-house to pick the right fintechs. So what we decided to do, I think about a year and a half ago, we teamed up with uh, PwC, the global consulting firm, and we run a program with them. We're now in phase two of that program through which PwC essentially provides us global access to their FinTech network. Um, they do the selection, the initial selection for us. We then work with PwC and the FinTechs to come to solutions for the bank. Um, phase, phase one was relatively successful. Phase two has been a lot more successful. And I think one of the key drivers has been that in phase two, we, we picked better areas to work in. Phase one, we did it ourselves, and we ended up essentially with our business as usual problems and business as usual projects and solutions. In phase two, we had an outside in view from PwC. We focused on areas where we essentially can increase our business 10 times by working with fintechs. Um, I'm very happy, very pleased to say that last week we went live with the first of these uh, fintechs, a company called uh, Thunes, which provides real-time remittances, which we now provide to Bangladesh, Pakistan and the Philippines. This, this is something we were not doing at all before. So this really brought something, uh, something new to us. Um, what, what we're looking for in fintechs, as I said, it, it needs to add value that we don't have ourselves and it needs to focus on a business that we can grow 10 times. The four fintechs that we ended up with in the end are not uh, phase one, are not, not the, the friends and family funded ones, but slightly bigger than that. Um, so that there is a management team in place that typically has been some outside funding already. Um, and uh, I must say the four that we ended up with have added enormous value to our business. Fantastic. Craig, from a uh, FinTech perspective, when you're looking for a partnership, if you guys look for partnerships, what should FinTechs be looking for in, in, in larger banks or other, offer, other entities that they're looking to partner with? Greg, you're mute. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. I, think, I think what's really important for a fintech, uh, as it is for any smaller organization when it's dealing with a larger organization that's far more mature and developed, is to really map on how you are going to make a partnership work. So you need a number of things. First of all, you do need support from the senior level within a bank. Because if you're working with a bank as a fintech, there are many, many, many individuals. And for a lot of fintechs, they will focus on some of the key areas that they would work with on a, in a BAU. So that might be the operational team, in our case, a credit team, sales teams, et cetera. But in a bank, there also are a lot of other teams that may not necessarily be hugely hands-on involved as the project is uh, set up or, or running but can be a source of frustration if you don't understand exactly what role they're trying to um, fulfill. So that might be in the IT security side of things, for example, where a fintech is focused on trying to get an operational solution in place and not understanding some of the nuances that a bank will have in some of its IT security concerns. Uh, in addition to that, you've also got to remember that fintech has written, you know, for nine out of 10 fintechs, they have probably one individual to every 10 plus more individuals in a bank. So the ability to work efficiently becomes incredibly important. And again, it goes back to why you do need that support from a senior level in a bank, because you are going to hit problems when you work with large organizations. You're going to come across multiple teams where you are struggling maybe to get direction. And therefore, you do need some senior sponsorship to help you navigate that or quite frankly, just to be able to push through that where there are issues. And for also a lot of other fintechs is, it's very easy to focus on what you think the partnership might look like, the revenues that may come from that. But there's a lot of hard work that has to go in before you even go live with the bank. 
and you need to make sure that you have some form of control in terms of driving the revenue creation. Because a lot of fintechs will go in partnership with banks, focus maybe on revenues, particularly if you're an operating fintech, rather than just a tech fin that's selling a software solution to a bank. Therefore, the destiny of what you're going to earn out of that contract or that partnership uh, is going to rest as well with the, with the bank. So you need to make sure that you've got a proper alignment of interest across that organization and you can actually execute. You know? Because I think it's, uh, banks ha can be the graveyard of a lot of fintechs if there isn't the right support in place. Fantastic. Thank you, Craig. Funchu, you're the only you're the only member of this panel outside of the, the Middle East. What is your approach? Uh, what is your approach where you are uh, currently to partnerships with fintechs or, or larger institutions? Okay, well, um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's interesting to also be the only outside the only participant, the only panelist outside of the Middle East here. Um, of course, uh, just as Craig had rightly said, that uh, the banks could be the graveyard for the fintechs. So the, the, the collaboration between banks in this part in Nigeria and Africa is really moving very fast. Um, uh, so some of the areas of collaboration, of course, the blockchain distributed ledger technology, uh, robotics, cybersecurity, particularly on artificial intelligence and uh, cognitive opportunities are areas that the banks here are exploring with the fintechs. So um, uh, I will give you some of the examples that are really spreading very fast. Uh, the water banking, uh, the water banking, a lot of the commercial banks here are really exploring that. Um, I operate particularly in the micro lending space and uh, we have come to the realization that without the fintech, that's the best way to reach these people um, for the people for financial inclusion um, and several other uh, customer-centric uh, engagements. So uh, the banks are really, have also come to the, uh, to the realization that without the FinTechs, uh, they cannot be customer-centric enough. They need to leverage on that technology. Um, the banks are, are big, they're, they're, they're quite large, um, but the technology, so the fintechs are smaller groups that are able to focus on some specific areas that will get the products of the bank to the final end users. So they're working on a lot of collaborations there and it's really moving very fast. Thank you. Okay, Paul, I think you're on mute, Paul. Yeah, as part of the reg Mohammed, as part of the regulatory body that oversees these types of uh, partnerships and having a, a fintech sandbox in Saudi, a fintech sandbox in the UAE, uh, what do you think the role is of the regulators uh, to provide the the outline for uh, these types of partnerships and how do they impact these types of partnerships? Thank you, thank you, Paul. And I cannot agree more with my fellow panelists, uh, what they mentioned. And, uh, and I believe before taking about, talking about the, the regulatory role, I think that the partnership between existing banks and those emerging fintech is very crucial for the fintech industry and the future of the banks, as well as for the fintech. And as we know, all is becoming widely uh, accepted practice uh, that both banks and fintechs come together to offer a new way of services or cover uh, a segment and so on. And there's many different types, of course, of, uh, of, of those partnerships. I'm not gonna go into details of those types where branding, co-branding or referrals or software solutions or acquisition from a bank to the FinTech and the benefits of each one. But I believe banks and financial institutions, they have a large customer that uh, the, the FinTechs will benefit from they have trusted brand and as well as risk measures and understand how to comply with regulation from the regulators. Fintechs also, as mentioned earlier, they develop those new products and innovation and they're fast in launching those innovation. In SAM and central banks, we do support those kinds of collaboration between, uh, between the financial institutions, banks and fintechs. And we even launched 
back in 2018 uh, with, the, with the support of our colleagues from Capital Market Authority, Fintech Saudi, was responsible to bring all those uh, together and educate the market and, and offer uh, shared uh, facilities as, as, well as, as well as bringing also the expertise to the, to the, to the players. Uh, we in SAMA and Central Bank as a regulator uh, support in different uh, initiatives and different strategies, the collaboration. We conducted uh, a research back in this year actually about the collaboration and open banking and service uh, through APIs and, uh, and sharing data. And we were really surprised in a, in a good way, the response we received from banks and their willingness to uh, collaborate with the authentics. Thank you, Mohammed. Ala, I would like to touch upon your, uh, your uh, group's involvement in these partnerships and collaboration. Uh, being a data aggregator, uh, a lot that Funchu talked about was artificial intelligence and machine learning, which requires a lot of data to be aggregated and distilled. How does how is uh, how is SEMA and the other credit bureaus uh, support in these type of partnerships uh, that you that you see and that your team sees? Uh, excellent. Thanks a lot, Paul. So uh, the way that I would explain it at the beginning is that there are two ways to look at it. Uh, how would the credit bureau uh, first of all, act as an enabler to the uh, fintech industry, and then how would the credit bureau themselves work in a partnership model with the uh, fintech industry? So when we're talking about new fintechs that are being licensed under the sandbox or currently are within the sandbox, how can we help them today in order to uh, provide these aggregated data that you just uh, uh, mentioned? and uh, the artificial intelligence that goes behind it and the uh, generation of the credit scores uh, and helping them to, to, to go through that journey. Now, uh, many of these fintechs, we know that some of them would have to go into a learning curve. Some of them do have experiences from, uh, from uh, different countries elsewhere. Uh, so enabling them whether with, with, with the right product services, solutions, pricing, uh, that is very much different from the rest of the MBFI. That is what we are trying to do with them. But on the other side, what we're trying to do is, uh, uh, as Dr. Byrne mentioned, is source the right uh, FinTech to partner with. Now, probably our sourcing mechanism is less uh, sophisticated, sophisticated than them, uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, we're not talking, there's a whole lot of companies that are working in uh, credit score uh, 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 enablement or new FinTech opportunities for credit scores. But one of the, uh, there, are, there are a couple, uh, which we managed to shortlist, uh, who basically work with alternative data now, may that be uh, telco data or may that be um, uh, uh, social media, uh, social network data. Uh, uh, and uh, another uh, solution is through uh, open banking and APIs uh, by getting information on uh, current accounts and um, saving accounts. If you, if you want, I can, I can probably share more about that uh, right now or on a later stage as you like. I think this uh, goes nicely, Allah. I think continue with the whole open banking premise because I think a lot of the fintechs uh, access to data is critical, right? So whether it's data from a bank, data from SEMA, alternative data from social media, I think that's a very important role. And what we've seen in the market today and speaking from a firsthand experience is that uh, there's very little sharing of data, whether it's a regulatory constraint, a company constraint, or a competitive uh, uh, constraint for larger institutions who hold that data. So I think you can continue with that, and then I'll go around to each of the panelists to talk a little bit about the open banking and how that will impact their business and uh, market shares. 
Fantastic. So on sharing of data, SEMA is trying to act as a centralized data hub today. So in the past, uh, 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 data aggregators or, or holders of data did not realize the huge value of that data. But today we are, we are under, underway uh, by going through partnerships with other data holders in the country. So one example would be uh, the salary information data holders, whether it was GOSI or PPA, Public Pension Agency, or the Ministry of Finance for the, for the government uh, employee uh, salary data. Now that data would need to be electronic and should, should be able to be availed to either the banking industry, the FIs themselves, or the new fintechs that are coming in, because that is the one of the main enablers that would that would uh, uh, enable the FIs to take decisions on the go and 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 it help them within the journey of digitization. So one is that SEMA is trying to be uh, uh, more just an aggregator of credit information. We're trying to. Um, satisfy the needs of the of the financial industry by instead of one linking with each and every uh, uh, company out there that holds data and different uh, types of integration, different types of uh, 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 files and whatnot, uh, uh, and and two is is availing that data. So today we are seeing that many of these companies are looking into commercialization. And looking into having that data without breaking any laws, without uh, uh, breaking the main uh, law, which is the consent of the customer, uh, uh, which SEMA uh, holds greatly uh, as we are regulated by the central bank, uh, because at the end of the day, it all falls down to the customer that is applying, uh, uh, that we enable this uh, flow of data and then uh, uh, sales of service. Uh, uh, that is probably what I would shed some light on, on how corporations, we're seeing corporations between other data holders today within the Saudi market. Craig, as, as, as being a fintech and uh, dealing in SMEs and, and data being and scoring being your, your one of the business value propositions that you guys have at, uh, at Beehive, how important is it to get to an open banking platform and getting the the required data for your platform to be more efficient? Yeah, it's very important. I think it's probably two things. One, it's open banking as we know it that's happening in other parts of the world, which is being able to access the bank data of a particular applicant or, or being able to pull that data in. But also, um, it's about third party data as well. So being able to link into some other aspects of the economy so that you can build a, a comprehensive picture. And really it comes down to what is the most efficient way of doing that because you know it, it, it's i think as you've got more organizations like simmer that can create a almost become a data backbone where lots of different data can feed in then it means that as a fintech you can link into the backbone and then pull various different data sources otherwise the fintech what you're doing is you're having to create api interfaces with every different partnership uh, that you work with and that can give you some competitive advantage in the, in, in the early days. Um, but like all technology, over time, it's going to become fairly uh, ubiquitous uh, over time. And then once that happens, you need to have other differentiators. So for us, collection of the data is only the first step. Obviously, the credit algorithms and the way that we credit score is, I guess, we're our secret sources. Um, but if we can accelerate the data collection so that you're doing that digitally, Therefore, all you're doing is, is you're, you're allowing yourselves to collapse the time it takes to do a credit assessment from days, hours to minutes to seconds. Um, but also you're trying to increase the accuracy of any credit score you're doing. So, and the, the key there is how many data points contribute to accuracy and then how many data points contribute to noise. Because there's no point analyzing 10,000 data points if 9,000 of them don't really get, add value. So, you're, so I think what you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you can create, uh, you can take the data in and then use that data in an effective and an efficient manner and make sure that you're spending your time integrating, pulling those data sources. But then also, I'm, I'm talking specifically to somebody who's doing a credit score. For us, then it's about taking that data in, 
uh, processing that, coming up with a credit score, and then over time continually checking new sources of data to see if they improve or add to your credit or are just a distraction. Yeah, and I think that's, and that's an ongoing. There's, there's no, once you do it, it's a continual working uh, thesis as you go forward. Fantastic. Mohammed, as the, as the central bank regulator, Sama, you're, you're, you're sort of caught in between both the regulatory and security aspects and then the need for innovation. So how does Sama balance this, uh, uh, this process, uh, allowing enough data out into the market potentially and, and balancing then the competitiveness, the competitiveness in the market itself? Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, so, from a regulatory perspective, we uh, we will be uh, studying the market and and looking into different restrictions, the benchmark, how they are implementing the open banking and sharing of those data, looking in different aspects of the transaction type, the what kind of products they offer, and the roadmap to implementing, reaching to some restriction to open finance. However. Now, currently, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we are studying the market. We conducted a research about the open banking and perspective from the market. Market sound is about from banks as well as from techs. We are also conducting a gap analysis in the regulatory framework. What kind of regulation do we need to make sure that we do have this kind of shared data? As we believe sharing data will guarantee a success of the fintechs without sharing the data from banks to those fintechs we believe it will not give them a chance for a competition so we want to increase the competition innovation we're looking into as well for uh, do we go with standardization of the api or having a room balancing between standardization as well as giving room for the market for innovation as as, as more as you go for standardization you will reduce definitely the innovation we're looking into as well the external regulation that uh, that will protect consumer for sharing the data, data protection laws similar to the PST2 in Europe. We are looking as well on, on the roadmap of how implementing, as, as I mentioned, the type of data to be shared, starting maybe with public, going to the transaction, maybe going to different products and credit and saving and uh, open finance. So we are currently at the stage of studying the market, looking at different restrictions, understanding what type of data to be shared, how this, those data will be shared either through uh, a national infrastructure or different infrastructure in place where they can link to each other and to the payment trail. If we're talking about uh, information service providers, they will have different requirement than uh, payment initiation different capital requirement, different kind of supervision, different kind of licensing regime, as well as different kind of uh, cybersecurity uh, requirements. So we're looking into all of those aspects and uh, we're thinking that we'll be coming with a new uh, approach and as well opening the market for, uh, for sharing those data in, in a staged manner. Thank you, Mohammed. How, how, how does this play out in your current market of, of open banking? Uh, are there a lot of regulatory requirements around it or it's, uh, it's very relaxed and uh, you guys have access to sufficient amount of data uh, and give out sufficient amount of data to other fintechs? So over here, it's still open banking is still um, at the quite early stage. Uh, the regulators are trying to pace up, to meet up with the other parts of the world. Um, of course, in Africa, um, Rwanda is, is making some progress, um, but we also know that the market is really large in, in West Africa and Nigeria in particular. So um, we have uh, the opportunities there is what I'm, I'm just going to talk about briefly. We still have a lot of uh, on banks and on the banks here. The open banking actually is going to be the solution to reaching them um, on the sharing of data that has to be properly regulated. That's also something that our regulators are deeply considering. Uh, we have the Central Bank of Nigeria uh, has made a public, uh, uh, a public request for information into the payment 
systems vision. So that's um, uh, something that they are, they are, they are as, well, as much as possible trying to get uh, opinion and do appropriate surveys on how that's going to work. Um, but again, uh, the most important aspect for us is that open banking really is the solution to reaching the unbanked and on the banks here. Thank you. Fantastic. And finally, uh, Dr. Byrne, in regards to being a, being a bank and probably being a provider of that data, uh, the capacity to cre create these flows of data, is, is, is it something that you guys are waiting to hear back from the regulators? Is this something that you guys are proactive in trying to provide? Uh, or is there some other methodology that you guys are following in regards to sharing of data? Yeah, I think, Paul, you mentioned it, uh, Mohammed and Allah uh, said the same. Uh, the moment that, you, that you're that you able to share and aggregate data, it becomes sort of exponentially more valuable than having just your, your own data. So if, if I look at, uh, at ourselves, we want to be able to essentially, in real time, open or allow any of our banking products to be, to be made available to new to bank customers. So you need, you need a couple of things for those. You need a well-functioning credit bureau, which is real-time accessible. You need uh, machine-readable uh, ID cards. That helps as well. Um, um, you need good data on financial statements, which is accessible in real time. And I think the, the aggregation of data, it's sort of in the interest of all the banks to do that. Um, and, and I see it happening. We have a couple of good examples of actual um, projects that are either, either have gone live or are close to going live. We're working with, uh, with a couple of banks in the UAE on sharing customer data for SMEs in, in a project called, uh, or an application called Norblock. This will allow essentially KYC data to be shared between banks on SMEs, which will make it much easier for them to open bank accounts. Uh, we're working together with Dubai Economy to use this kind of data and essentially provide instant account opening to newly licensed entities, which used to be a very difficult thing for these entities to get a bank account. We want to make it real time. So it's, it's again, it's the sharing of data that makes this kind of things possible. Um, I think the, the older banks understand that um, and all of the banks are willing to contribute to this. As to open banking, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think uh, in terms of open banking, as we see it in Europe, we're perhaps a little bit away from that. What we have learned from working with all of these fintechs is that you definitely need to be an open bank. You need to have an API-based infrastructure. You need to be, to be able to get your, your core banking system accessible through APIs. Um, I think we're going to talk about the, the people later on, but I think from a technical perspective, it's absolutely crucial that you work on the basis of APIs because that will make life much easier for the uh, for the fintechs. It will make it much easier to integrate with a with a credit bureau uh, as well. Okay, th thank you, Dr. Byrne. Craig, I want to touch upon in regards to to fintechs in the market in in, in the region specifically. How difficult have you found it to scale a business? In, in the current environment? Is, is, it, is it as difficult or more difficult uh, than what your past experiences have been and why? That's a good question. Um, I think, uh, so if, if I think when we started, which was 2014, um, nobody was talking about FinTech in, in the region in 2014. At that time, the main focus was probably e-commerce, maybe logistics. So you do tend to find that things go in waves, particularly in the startup community. So uh, I think in, in the early days for us, it was a lot about education. We had to educate the market. And when you've only got one or two players in the market, the cost of educating the market falls disproportionately on a couple of players. So um, you know, that, 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 was, that was a challenge. Um, I think we also know that you, you know, things that happen in the, in the wider economy either become hinderers to, to your business or they become accelerators of your business. So uh, you know, the likes of COVID, anybody in the uh, digital payment space, it's been good, right? It's accelerated digital payments. If you look at e-commerce uh, in, in the region, e-commerce has probably accelerated from where most of the analyst reports would expect it to be. 
because suddenly people who weren't used to ordering online and paying online were suddenly finding they had to. Um, so you saw some accelerants in that. In the credit space, unsurprisingly, we saw a drop off in April as everybody tried to take stock of what was happening in the market. Um, but we've been pleasantly surprised with uh, the way the markets come back for us. Now, you know, as, as, a, as a, I guess, as an SME lender in our market space, we're obviously in a, in a market where there's 20 odd banks and uh, we're only gonna still be a relatively small part of the market, but we're seeing quite a bit of demand there. We're also seeing a lot of the banks have pulled back in SME. You know, it, it, banks tend to move in waves. Um, they're either very bullish in a certain market, and then if certain things happen, they pull back uh, quite, quite rapidly. And we've seen that particularly in the SME lending space. So for, for us, it, it's tougher than it was pre-COVID. But in terms of the opportunities, particularly on the partnership sides, and it goes back to some of the um, other panelists' discussions, is that we are getting approached a lot more on partnerships where uh, more established organizations are seeking us out to see how we can work together. Um, and that's because you know, we are effectively a monoline business. You know, we're in the SME lending space. That's what we do. We want to be the best at doing that. Whereas a bank has to think and, and, and bank leadership has to think about how does fintech touch all aspects of their business. So um, I, I agree with the point that you need to become an open bank, certainly in mentality and also in APIs. Um, but you also have to juggle an awful lot of partnerships potentially. So you need to have real belief and support in the team that you are enabling to interface with, it, with, 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 with the fintechs. Because after a while, I can certainly see a lot of bank models becoming essentially hubs for pulling together lots of different services and the bank essentially owning the end user, the end client, but being an amalgamation of almost, almost physical banks becoming virtual banks because their IT departments are essentially becoming an amalgamation of many different best of breed solutions as long as they can be integrated without too much overhead. So I think it's going to be a fascinating time. And I know this may, may touch another point you want to talk about, but I do think that's going to be the future as well of how fintechs and financial institutions work. Um, but for us, I guess we're all going to see how the next six to nine to 12 months uh, uh, turns out, but we're actually quite bullish. We're cautious, but we are actually bullish. Fantastic. Uh, Mohammed. this goes back to uh, Sama, what advice do you have for fintechs that are or startups that are coming into the market? Obviously, you have fintechs that are already based out of Dubai, but everyone looks towards the Saudi market as being the, the largest economy uh, in the region uh, and trying to enter this market. We've seen uh, a big amount of new fintechs being announced from Fintech Saudi in the Sam Fintech Sandbox from Sama. And I can only imagine that it's going to get exponentially bigger over time. Um, so what advice do you have for people who are looking to set up a fintech or are wanting to enter this market? What advice can you give them? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Before we go into the, the advice, I'm just going to take one or two minutes talking about the current ecosystem and the elements that in our in the, in the, in the kingdom ecosystem that will support uh, the, the, the startups and fintech to get traction in the competitive market we do have access to access to capital uh, there is grants there is accelerator as well there is an investment fund we do have access to experience based advice and we're building on those we're trying to uh, to to include or develop initiatives that to make sure that there is access to experience and a district champion similar to fintech saudi we're providing guidance on the regulation access to information as well as they share the services and facilities. We do have access to marketing consumer. As you uh, correctly mentioned at the beginning, the sandbox. We have two, two different two sandboxes actually in the kingdom. One under SAMA's central bank remit and one within the CMA remit where fintechs and startups, they can try and test their innovative uh, services to, to, to start looking into what threats, what risks are there. And we try to close the gap with issuing uh, a specific service, specific regulations where we do have proportionalities in regulations. 
uh, access to market infrastructures. We could we 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 discussed the APIs. We discussed as well the how the connection, the connectivity will be through those uh, market infrastructures. So bas basically, we do have those in place. Basically, we we are developing new initiatives both in the financial sector uh, by uh, coordination between different authorities, uh, central bank, uh, capital market authority, we're taking a, as well the uh, import the financial sector development program to make sure that we do have an attractive or, or even, even have it more attractive environment for those fintechs to operate and, uh, and open in the, in the kingdom. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I think in your, your mute, Paul. Sorry. Ala, how do you how do you feel about the uh, kingdom's infrastructure and path forward in regards to supporting fintechs uh, and SEMA support and the credit bureau support of fintechs coming into the market? Uh, excellent. Thanks, Paul. So th the way that I see it, and in comparison to uh, close by markets infrastructure, is that I think that Saudi Arabia is, is, is a little bit far ahead uh, when it comes to the availability of data, the aggregation of data, and the disbursement of data to uh, uh, the financial institution within the kingdom. And may that be on SME or commercial data, or may that be on consumer data. So when we talk about uh, the major data hubs today uh, on the consumer side, whether it was uh, ELM that is providing the uh, uh, NIC national uh, uh, data hub, and uh, or whether it was on the Ministry of Commerce and the electronic um, uh, financial statements and the data that is there, or whether it was with the credit bureau and the detailed uh, credit information that is there along with the scoring models to be dispersed. Uh, I think that we are uh, uh, quite far ahead. Nonetheless, uh, we still have a lot to do in order to, I wouldn't say catch up because different markets have different needs. So, and, and you would, we would see today when we benchmark and we continuously benchmark ourselves because yes, we are the leading credit bureau in Saudi Arabia, but it doesn't mean that we need to lay back. We need to actually keep exploring and see what's happening outside there in order to find the right things to apply to Saudi Arabia. So when we are currently uh, going into uh, alternative data and evaluating uh, partner, partnering with these fintechs and looking who's good and who's not and what type of data. We are looking at the incremental value that they bring because in some of the studies we found that actually uh, uh, such information is not benefiting uh, Saudi Arabia with its current GDP. It, it might benefit a country with a lower or, a, or a, for this solution in particular, for a lower G a country, or the country with a lower GDP per capita. But uh, when, we, when we went and explored a different set of data, we actually found that there is an uplift within the predictability of the score, uh, which might lead to uh, better decision making by the FI or by the fintech. And when I'm talking over here, um, uh, yes, I am being quite generic because a lot of the services we are providing, we're providing to the whole financial sector. Uh, but if I may want to be specific, I'll be specific in two areas. So one is that we have noticed that there is quite a need. Um, uh, 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 there, there is quite a need with uh, softwares, for example. Uh, so we've tried to develop easy to, to, to reach uh, uh, hosted software that is basically OPEX operated. So as the, as the FinTech grows, that cost grows. Um, uh, that is on one side. Another side, just to go back and to shed some light on open banking, and we hope we can probably see a fintech that is coming to, to link that area. Today, we are seeing in one of the case studies we're viewing in the US, whereby they apply open banking with the credit bureau in order to access, for the credit bureau to access your current account. Now, why is that? Basically, what the credit bureau would get, would get hash information 
from your current account, whether you're paying certain bills uh, on time, whether your expenses are uh, on average, so you don't have major spikes up and down every month. And that information, if it's quite solid, it can help you to boost your score by 10 to 15 points. And for somebody who is, for example, a 690 score, and the bank will only accept 700 and above, that would make a tremendous uh, different decision. So we are trying to find every certain way to apply these changes and look into how it would help uh, uh, the, the, the society and the fintechs and the FIs. So we're, we're, all, we're just sitting in the middle and we're trying to please everybody over there. Fantastic, thank you, thank you, Allah. Uh, let's check upon the people and, and corporate culture in regards to um, in regards to these partnerships between fintechs and larger institutions. I think, Dr. Burton, I think uh, you would be a great person to start off this conversation. Obviously, a, a banking culture. Uh, people look at banks as uh, the slow-moving uh, uh, iceberg versus versus fintech, and how is that changing? Uh, since you've been in the market for quite some time, how do you see that changing and how important is it for this innovation to move forward? I've, I think it's absolutely crucial to start with your, uh, with your last question. Um, I, I wouldn't say that banks are, are icebergs, but it, it's, it's a fact of life that we, in the case of CBD, we have 50 years of history uh, that we carry with us. If you look at some of the, the banks in Europe, you talk about more than 100 years of history. So that, that legacy is there, and to a large extent, that, that history is, um, is visible in the legacy systems and in the legacy data structures. So that, that is a, a major issue um, that we see. I think in terms of, of people, um, I have seen a lot of change over the last uh, 20 years in, in the senior team. Um, I am convinced that everybody at a senior level today is a change manager or a project program manager, whatever you want to call it. Um, banks or every company are changing fast and are probably changing faster than they've done in, in, in the past 100 years. Um, if I look at my own senior team, I have people with a consultancy background. I have people that are focused on change, that are focused on, on, uh, on realizing change, uh, that are focused on getting the benefits out of digital and technology. And that, that is absolutely crucial because the moment you start talking to the fintechs, and that's something that we learned as well, um, you typically find people that are extremely competent, that are um, extremely knowledgeable about the system that they present to you or the solution they present to you because it's something that they've built themselves. It's something that they've given their blood, sweat and tears for. So you have to make sure that the people on your side as well can, can talk, have the same knowledge and bring the same passion to the table. Um, if you don't do that, then you end up in a situation that, that Greg was describing where you, you sort of need your way, need to work around the organization, um, need to get senior management support uh, to make things happen. For sure, uh, for some people in the bank, like in every organization, change is, uh, is uh, scary. Uh, but I think in general, the attitude and the mentality of people has changed a lot and will continue to change. Uh, great. I want to just go to Funchu first before we start taking questions from the audience. In regards to people and their uh, their abilities, uh, do you guys is there a large gap in, in your region in regards to fintechs uh, and banking, or are they on par to the same uh, same uh, learning curve? Um, thank you, Paul. So. In our space, it's um, they're sort of at par. Uh, yes, the banks are also uh, are also quite advanced um, in, in some of those plays. But you know, the fintechs also a lot of them are coming from the banking sector. So already there's a knowledge. Uh, um, uh, they are already quite skilled on the banking process and on the fintech side. So. Um, uh, so it's, the difference is not so much. However, what is critical again is leadership. It's important that there's proper leadership in place. Um, and I think that surrounds everything. Now, let me take it from the perspective of the FinTech. The FinTechs are globally, uh, supposedly uh, more agile 
they've got very good agility uh, compared to the banks. That seems to be a general belief in our space. Um, however, when they now get into that collaboration with the banks, uh, it brings up, uh, yes, uh, several of the processes and the systems are different, but the basic knowledge, the expertise, the fintechs are doing very well in that. Uh, now, I would say that, uh, let, let me tilt this a little to the COVID. Um, uh, when the COVID got deep into Africa, uh, the banks that were able to switch or collaborate better with the fintechs are having a field day, particularly in the micro lending space uh, where you have uh, uh, payroll lending, salary advance. Uh, that switch was able to really push. There was a lot, a, a very good push for the banks because it's um, working with the fintechs, media systems, seamless media systems, better convenient for the customers. Now this could not have happened if the fintechs had that um, knowledge or were downgraded as regards the expertise. So yes, they are sort of at par and that makes the working easy. But in all, uh, most important is the leadership. It's the leadership uh, from the perspective of the banks on how they can coordinate better, work better uh, and achieve the uh, expected customer centric targets. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, I think, remaining in the session. We have a few questions from the audience that I'll read out and go through, and then I'll direct those questions to the panelists. So the first question from the audience to all panelists is SMEs and MENA are lacking in sufficient data transparency, even for standard financial accounts. How are fintechs, banks, and regulators alike looking to improve data availability from S from SMEs for better evaluation and enabling support to them. So Allah, I think you're, you should be able to take this question. Thanks, Paul. So if we understand uh, the question correctly, uh, the problem is uh, a better evaluation and support, meaning funding. So how can we, so this is basically coming from an SME that is, that is seeing that they don't have enough information to be evaluated by an FI to, to provide that support. So how, are, how is SEMA today? How is the credit bureau trying to resolve this matter? So if we look at all of the company, all of the companies in Saudi Arabia working today that are getting actual access to funding, whether funded or non-funded products, uh, uh, we would find that, that they are in the range of 10 to 15% maximum of the working companies that are in Saudi Arabia. Then how are the rest of the SMEs actually working? They are basically getting, uh, uh, they, are, they are working on receivables, right? So they are working on SME to SME funding. So what are we trying to do? we are trying to get grasp of that data. So today within SIMA, we have around 350 members that are feeding us with information on individuals and, and commercial companies. So there are no 350 FIs in Saudi Arabia. It's only barely 75. So who are the rest? The rest are actually major corporations that each one of them is dealing with 10, 20, 30,000 companies on, on receivable basis on, so, 60, 90 days payments, and they are holding those aging files. So what we are doing, we are basically connecting with these companies and getting those aging files, uploading them into our commercial database. So what do we have right now? Instead of having access to 10% to 15% of the companies with credit data, we suddenly have 50% uh, 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 companies access on their credit data. So that receivable performance, so whether I have taken uh, 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 some merchandise from Dr. Byrne and I'm paying that on time every 60 days, I'm paying that on time. That is a very good indicator that any bank would take today into a credit decision. So we are trying to avail that information and make it, make it possible for either banks or fintechs as Beehive to use that data and take and make credit decisions. Now, not, we're not only stopping there, but also, as I mentioned before, with government entities linking with 
uh, MCI data, but that is mostly demographic or linking with the uh, financial data, which is Qawa'im in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but again, that it is also limited. We only have around 80,000 uh, or 100,000 uh, financial statements until now. Yes, it's growing rapidly, but how do we help? We are seeing that the way to help is getting data from, from basically companies that are dealing in receivables. Thank you. Thank you. If, if I can add to that, uh, Paul, because I think uh, Allah is 100% right. The key will be to get reliable, um, high, not high frequency, but more real-time type of data. For a bank, it is, especially in this environment, it's pretty much useless to look at 2018 audited financials today. Because 2018 December was a different world in, in every, even 2019 audited financials are already very much outdated as we speak today. So whatever we can do by working together, whatever we can do by, by providing more data to the credit bureau and ending up with a more real-time reflection of the actual credit standing of the SME, that will make life a lot easier for banks in, in order to provide funding. Yeah, I'd also add, if I can, Paul, I think, yeah. I think it falls into two categories, particularly in the SME space. One is education, yeah, and I think that's a continual thing. You need to uh, be educating SME uh, owners uh, and management teams to be keeping accurate up-to-date records, etc. I mean, that's just good practice, generally, for a business. But on the data side, you're really looking at three things. Um, as Dr. Burns said, you're looking at timely information, so you want timely information then you need to be able to normalize it. So if you want to be able to analyze big data sets or analyze data sets quickly, you, you need to have, a, as a receiver of that, you need to have a, a way of normalizing that data. And then the third thing is you need to be able to verify it. So whether you're using a simmer or whomever, you know, once you've got that data, a lot of times then you're looking to validate data points you've got. Because when we analyze data, a lot of the times we're almost using triangulation. So we, we can have two pieces of data and we can almost presume the third piece of data. As long as we can verify that third piece of data, then that's what's accelerating. And that's where you get a, a cumulative effect. So I think it's timely normalizing and verifying. And then just generally it's educating. Because if I'm an SME owner and I know by keeping my records up to date regularly, I've got a better chance of getting a lower cost of finance and getting finance quickly when I need it. Why wouldn't I do that? Yeah, that's incumbent on me to do that. So I think you're going to see more and more of that happening. And as it becomes normalized in terms of business owners talking to business owners and somebody saying, hey, I got a loan in two days or a day and somebody else is going, but it, it take me four months. Why? Well, that's because I could provide them with this data quite quickly. And, and you know, that's how the market will move as well. Okay, very good. Um... We have another question from the audience here. Developing enterprise AI applications on the AWS cloud requires significant assembly of bespoke services and can be complex and time consuming. What will be your advice to address the same? And I think here, I think it's just the time consuming aspects of looking at different types of AI applications. I know there's some in the market, some that we use currently here at Alrida that are automated machine learning and AI platforms. Uh, I think it goes two parts. There's an AI platform and your algorithms, and then there's the cleanliness and structure of data. So, and I think the biggest pitfall is the actual cleanliness and structure of the data and not the application of artificial intelligence or machine learning platforms. I don't know how you guys feel about that. I know Craig, you probably use a machine learning platform or have your algorithms as well. Allah has the data, but it's not necessarily structured in ways that can be used. So I think this goes, uh, it touches upon a lot of different aspects of what we're talking about currently. So I, I think Craig, you opened your mic. So I think you have, you, you have something to say. <laughs> yeah, just, just quick, just quickly to say that I think it's, it's you've got to understand in all business, right? Whether it's FinTech, whether it's, you know, technology is the enabler. Uh, it is ultimately just the enabler. So, it, you know, when people start looking at machine-based learning or artificial intelligence, the quality of the data that you can actually put into your system is going to be key. So back to your point about the cleanliness of data. And also, you've got to, uh, for a lot of people, have got to understand that AI or even machine-based learning needs a lot of data to get any real value out. 
Now, the whole concept of machine-based learning is you're not really doing anything. The machine is trying to look for patterns. But to look for patterns, it needs an awful lot of data. So it's an iterative process, but it starts off with making sure that you're trying to make the data that you bring into your systems as clean as possible, where you've got a filtration, filtration mechanism. And I think when a lot of people look at, hey, there's these tools or AI up, uh, applications that I can bolt onto this, you've got to make sure you're in the right uh, position to, to get any value out of those. Because you may look at them and other companies are using them, but if another company is analyzing 100,000 data sets every day and you're analyzing five, you don't need that AI application. Yeah? You're not at that point where you need that yet. So it's understanding does it fit into what you're actually doing? But also, can you feed it clean data? I think I'd focus on that before I suddenly said, I, I, we need to be using this AI application and that AI, AI application. If I, if I may add to, add to that, uh, Craig and Paul. Uh, so we do have access to lots, to lots of data, but it's not necessarily all published. And we need to make sure of that. Because as Craig mentioned, at the end of the day, data that is not scalable and you don't have wealth of it or width of it, then there is no need of it, actually, because you can't really build decisions on that. Today, we have two organizations which we have between them combined, we probably have three quarters of the population of Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, certain information on them, but we are not publishing it. Why? Because there's problems with the data itself. So everything we are publishing today, it has to be 100% accurate. It has to be scalable. And, uh, and, and, and probably, probably, Paul, uh, uh, as a member of SEMA, you would actually know that we are on these quality reports that we usually send to the CEOs of the FIs and the banks and the insurance companies. And whenever we see that the data quality level has gone down, we send, we, we send, another, uh, 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 we send another letter to our member and telling them exactly where was the problem. And today we're running data quality rates in the consumer side of over 99.7 on the commercial side of not over 97%. So we do take that seriously because at the end of the day, if I make this data available and it's not up to standard or not up to par, actually CRED would make the, the wrong uh, uh, credit decisions. Fantastic. Uh, there's no more questions, so we're about to wrap up. Funchu, I just want to touch on with you. Where do you see these partnerships going and, and what do you see for the future of, uh, of, of FinTech partnerships with banks or other institutions? You're on mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we see we see a lot of more partnerships coming up. It's important that the fintechs um, function with the mindset that uh, it's better to collaborate rather than to compete. The banks also need technology um, so they can leverage rather than build the technology in-house rather than now, you know, before now the question used to be how do we build it? Um, what do we need to build? Uh, but rather, it's now that this is what we want. So who can we collaborate with? Who are our best options for collaboration? So the banks are looking at that. And then the fintechs are also looking to collaborate, get into a marriage, get in bed with the banks, and um, you know, reach the customers more. Uh, of course, I, I would also say the challenges are there. In our, in our client, the challenges of capital is there for the fintechs. But you know, again, if you can, uh, you've got the, the skills, you've got the, the expertise, you've got the product that is not easily replicable. Um, so at that point, collaboration is a lot um, better. And uh, so to answer your question directly, where do I see it? Um, I, see, I see that in the short time, uh, the fintechs would be at par with the banks because that actually is a, uh, a, 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 a very fast flowing area, fast growing, uh, as the fintechs are, you know, doling out a lot of good solution that customers would require. And Fantastic. I think we're closing in on time here. I think it's uh, very important that we thank all of the panelists here for uh, their input. It's been a very good conversation. I think it's a, a very healthy conversation and it's one that we'll continue to have for a very long time going forward uh, as this should be the future of 
of, of banking and finance in the region. Again, I would like to thank the panelists for their input and their time in, uh, in this. Thank you guys again. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, and a huge thanks to you all thanks, for joining Paul. and sharing your thoughts. It was great. Thanks, guys. Pleasure. Thank you all.